good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. And thanks for tuning in. It's my pleasure to be here and very anxious, as always, to continue our reading and discussion of the current book we're studying, The Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson. And yesterday we concluded with a summary by R.W. Thompson of the teachings of Archbishop Manning on papal infallibility and the limits, or lack thereof, of uh, the jurisdiction of the papacy. Proclaiming that the Pope literally is God on earth. If you take it all in context and put it all together, you can come to no other conclusion that the Pope is, as it were, God on earth. And he may decide what his rights are, he may not be held to question by any authority on the earth that he is sovereign, supreme, infallible, and that every other power on earth, particularly the civil governments of the world, must do as he said. And there must be a union of church and state so that the state, in its proper sphere of operations, should be a servant of the church and obey the church, and impose the Roman Catholic Church's law upon the people. Because the, the law of the Roman Catholic Church is, quote-unquote, God's law. And that law can only be interpreted by the Pope. So the Pope is the end-all and be-all of God, of Christianity and of its scope and power in the world. Now, we're going to back up a few paragraphs from where we left off for continuity purposes and to reiterate this, this summary by this Archbishop Manning. It says, Thus the Pope is made the last, final, and only judge in everything. He is the tribunal of last resort upon every question he shall undertake to decide. He is infallible whenever he shall decide, and whenever he declares himself to be so. Whatsoever he commands in the vast domain embraced by his jurisdiction has infallibility instantaneously attached to it. Whatsoever he shall announce in reference to the church, its history, its faith, its discipline, its rules of ethics, its requirements of its members, its demands upon the world, its rights, its authority, his, po and his own power and that of his hierarchy in all the nations, all this becomes absolute truth and must be accepted and obeyed as such. There must be no doubting, no hesitation, no inquiry, no resort to reason, for either to doubt or to hesitate or to inquire, or to appeal to reason, is heresy. The most accredited books of history must be closed. The mind must be shut up so that not a ray of light can penetrate it. The reason, that is, reason, the ability to reason, the function of reasoning in a man's mind must be stifled by closing every avenue of access to it. The whole man must be subjugated. Everything must be surrendered to the Pope, because it is impossible for him to err. Because the Church itself is the divine witness, the divine teacher, and the divine judge of the revelation entrusted to it. Because no human power can revise or criticize or test the Roman Catholic Church's teachings because the pastors of the church, with their head, the Pope, are a witness divinely sustained and guided to guard and to declare the faith, because these obtain their testimony not in human history, but in apostolic tradition, in Scripture, in creeds, in the liturgy, in the public worship and law of the church in councils, and in the interpretation of all these things by the supreme authority of the church itself. That is, the Pope, 
and because the church, through the Pope, can alone determine the extent of its own infallibility. That's a summary of Archbishop's, Arch, Archbishop Manning's dissertation on the infallibility of the Pope and his jurisdiction and the scope of his office. Now, Archbishop Manning is beyond all question a man of eminent ability far too sagacious not to see the results which must logically follow from these papal doctrines, this absorption of all power within the illumination, uh, excuse me, within the illimitable domain of faith and morals by an infallible pope, and therefore observing the present condition of the Christian world and seeing the nation's hitherto Roman Catholic and we're talking about Europe and its rebellion against the temporal power of the Pope, its rebellion against the Jesuit order. They kicked the Jesuits out. They dethroned their kings. They put republics in their place. They elected their own government. They threw off the papal yoke, said, Pope, you cannot be a king anymore. If you want to remain the Bishop of Rome, that's fine, but you're not going to govern us anymore. Europe was in rebellion in a Protestant protest against the papacy in Europe. And it says, and therefore observing the present condition of the Christian world and seeing the nations hitherto Roman Catholic, in other words, they'd always been Roman Catholic in the past, gradually conceded to the people, not the Pope, to the people, more political rights than they had ever enjoyed before, and witnessing the fact that the Roman Catholic people of Italy, that is, the Roman Catholic people of Italy, that nation wherein resides the papacy, the very seat of papal authority in the world, both spiritual and temporal, that's right, the Roman Catholic people of Italy have solemnly decided with wonderful unanimity that the Pope shall be king of Rome no longer, but a mere bishop of the church. He breaks out in these doleful words. Yes, they stripped the Pope of his temporal power. He was no longer a king, not even in Rome. The Pope lamented, quote, but what security has the Christian world? Without helm, without chart, and without light, it has launched itself into the falls of revolution. There's not a monarchy that it has not threatened. Listen, the papal system, the system of the temporal power of the Pope and his ecclesiastical power, in other words, all the power of the Pope, was carried out by the monarchs of Europe. They were seated and crowned by the Pope. They served the Pope. Now there's rebellion all throughout Europe. The Protestant Reformation and the effects of reading the Bible and the realization that the papacy is just a mere man at best and Antichrist at worst threw them off, established their own, and, we'll say, and said, we will govern ourselves through the leading and teaching of the Bible, the more pure Christianity took its root in Europe and the papacy was put to rest. Vacation. Permanent vacation for the Pope. And the monarchical system that sustained the papacy was destroyed. And it says without... It, it says the... the, 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 the Roman Catholic Europe, that monarchical Europe, was in a state of revolution. And it says there's not a monarchy that is not threatened. That's right. The Protestant Reformation destroyed the papal monarchies of Europe. And it said in Spain and France, the two most Catholic countries that had always defended the papacy, and even at one time France was the seat of the, of the papal throne, 
in Spain and France, even in Spain and France, monarchy is already overthrown. The hated syllabus, that is the syllabus of error that damned all of this revolution, that damned any form of government that de defied or denied the temporal and spiritual domain of the Pope, it, the syllabus of error will have its justification. The syllabus which condemned atheism and revolution would have saved society, lamented the Pope. But men would not. In other words, they wouldn't accept it. They, have, uh, they are dissolving the temporal power of the vicar of Christ. And why do they dissolve it? Because governments are no longer Christian. That's what he said. They've thrown off my system of government. Therefore, they are no longer Christian governments. Now, with that under your belt, how do you believe the Pope saw the most progressive government on earth at the time, the American government? Established for religious liberty, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, freedom to keep and bear arms, freedom to criticize both the Pope and the King. And that not only was the government not subservient to the papacy anymore, it was, God forbid, a servant of the people. The cattle, the catechumen, the lowest scum on the earth, the average American citizen became the literal government of this country. And they told the government what to do. The whole, in the Pope's eyes, the whole world was turning topsy-turvy. All of a sudden, you had the head at the bottom, the Pope. And you had the bottom at the top, the people. There's not a more revolutionary set of circumstances that ever could have befallen the papacy than the Protestant Reformation and the overturning of papal authority, spiritual and temporal. Even in Roman Catholic Italy, in the shadow of the walls of the Vatican, Victor Emmanuel stripped the kingly crown off the Pope's head and said, if you want to remain the bishop of the Roman Catholic Church in Italy, that's fine, but... We will run the government. It couldn't have gotten worse for the papacy. But in spite of all of that rebellion, in spite of the fact that the papal chair was nothing but a cartoonish example, ready for the trash bin of history, the papacy stood up and wrote the syllabus of error, damning all of this rebellion, every form of government that sprang out of the Protestant Reformation, and then declared himself infallible at the Council of 1870. A full-on assault against the Protestant Reformation. Declared himself infallible. Declared that there should once again be the union of church and state, that the church should rule the state and the state should serve the church and the people should just shut up and do what they're told. That's what the papacy would restore to the world if it could, and it already has. It's called the New World Order. R.W. Thompson saw it back in the 1870s. He saw what, happened, what, is, what is happening in this world today. Now we'll continue with where we left off yesterday. With Archbishop Manning and all who maintain, as he does, the enormous powers and prerogatives of the Pope, all governments not monarchical, in other words, the United States government, are revolutionary. That is, they're in rebellion. And they are atheism and revolution. 
and that atheism and revolution are twin sisters. The Pope, as king of Rome, was a temporal monarch and wore a crown just like any other king. The loss of it by him and the like loss in France and Spain contributed at least to one practical result, the advancement of the people toward that condition in which they may have some voice in making the laws under which they are to live, and the creation of a hope that the time may come when they shall get along with their public affairs without the assistance of monarchs, without the, the assistance of papally appointed monarchs. And while this is the case of exaltation and gladness to all the advocates of popular government, that is, governments of, by, and for the people, to the papist, it is the cause of sadness and grief, because he sees in the loss of the monarchy the certain death of the papacy, the sure downfall of the whole superstructure of the papal, the papal temporal domain. And he exclaims, as Archbishop Manning does, that, quote, governments are no longer Christian, unquote, because they are no longer Roman Catholic. There is with him no other Christianity than that religion professed by the Roman Catholic Church under papal dictation. Every man who does not believe as the Roman Catholic Church teaches through the Pope is worse than a heathen. He's an infidel. Protestantism embodies no religion at all. It is infidelity and the most odious form of heresy. Under its pernicious influence, in other words, under the pernicious influence of Bible-believing Protestantism, the world is rapidly drifting toward a fearful precipice without helm, without chart, and without light, and must soon, if not arrested by the papal arm, plunge into the terrible abyss below. When it shall have done this, and darkness and despair have settled over the fair places of the earth, and the groans of suffering humanity shall have reached into the heavens, then the hated syllabus will have its justification, because it pointed out the method of escape the syllabus would have saved society, says the Pope. Having thus ascertained what the infallibility of the Pope means, according to the definition of its ablest advocates, who are themselves infallible, how it raises up the papacy above all human governments and all the nations and peoples of the earth, how it likens the Pope to God in all the essential attributes of sovereignty. How it enables the Pope to decide for himself and without any human restraint the extent and nature of his own personal power and authority over mankind. How completely it demands the closing of all investigation the shutting up of all minds and the passive and humiliate, humiliating obedience of both intellect and will to all papal decrees, and how it possesses coercive power to enforce this obedience when it is refused, our investigations would be incomplete if we did not hereafter carry them to the point of ascertaining just how the ills and with which society is now afflicted are to be remedied. How, when all mankind shall come to obey the Pope, they are to be governed, if that millennial period shall ever arrive. Do you hear the reference that R. W. R. W. Thompson just made? That millennial era? That millennial period? That thousand-year period? When the King of kings and Lord of lords on the earth, the Pope shall reign supreme? He says, we have the means of discovering something about the past and know what the present is. But what kind of future there is in store for us when the papacy shall triumph 
as its devotees pretend to believe it will, can only be learned from its authoritative teachings and from its past history. Whatever its history has been and whatever its present teachings are, the whole is accepted as infallible truth by those who submit to the dogma of papal infallibility. Whatever they may be tomorrow or the next day or the next year or at any time in the immediate or remote future, they will be accepted in like manner. For the papacy, under the guidance of the crafty followers of Loyola, that is the Jesuit order, demands submission, not merely to all the past and present decrees of the popes, but to all that any future pope or the present one shall hereafter promulgate. Thus the Catholic world, a Roman Catholic publication, instructs us. In an article upon papal infallibility published in the number of August 1871, this doctrine is set forth in these words, quote, A Catholic must not only believe that the Roman Catholic Church now possesses a uh, not only believe what the Roman Catholic Church now proposes to his belief, but be ready to believe whatever the Roman Catholic Church may hereinafter propose. And he must therefore be ready to give up any and all of his probable opinions so, uh, so soon as they are condemned and proscribed by a competent authority. In other words, the thought police. The thought police is the Vatican. And whatever you believe now, you better be prepared to abandon. And the moment Pope proscribes it and proscribes something else. That is your commitment as a Roman Catholic to believe and to think and to do whatever the papacy says. And this he must do, as the same authority instructs us, with, quote, unquestioning submission and obedience of the intellect and the will, by the forfeiture of his manhood and the debasement of his nature, and with no more right to ask reasons of either the Pope or his priest than he has to ask them of Almighty God himself. The servitude of a Negro slave was not more humiliating, the difference being only the substitution of the lash of excommunication for that of the slave driver. Thus, by the wonderful perfectness of this ecclesiastical organization called the Roman Catholic Church, we find it in the possession of authority over the minds, the consciences, the thoughts, and the actions of so large a portion of our American population as to assure us with reasonable certainty that many of them will attempt to do, directly or indirectly, whatsoever the Pope shall require of them to do that he would reconstruct our government so as to make it conform to his own views in all those things which concern the Roman Catholic Church, its welfare, and its faith by subordinating all of our Protestant constitutions and laws in each of these particulars to his sovereign will, no fair-minded and sensible man would deny. pretty fair assessment, I'd say. Now we'll continue our reading and discussion of this most prophetic book by R.W. Thompson. He says that the Pope would reconstruct our government so as to make it conform to his own views in all those things which concern the Roman Catholic Church, its welfare and its faith, by subordinating all our constitutions and laws in each of these particulars, to his sovereign will, no fair-minded and sensible man will deny. If you understand the motive behind the syllabus of error, the papal decree of infallibility of 1870, and everything that came out of the Vatican since those decrees, 
you have to come to only one conclusion, that if given the power, if the papal temporal power was restored in the world, the first thing he'd do is overthrow this government. If you are an able-minded man, a sensible man, a fair-minded man who can assess the facts on the ground as they existed during this period of time, you could come to only one conclusion, that the papacy would overthrow our Constitution and laws, which are uniquely Protestant. And that's the point that is left out of nearly every discussion about this so-called New World Order, that the real target of this syllabus of error, the, the decree of papal infallibility, and even the current ecumenical movement of post-Vatican Council II, the main target of all of them was Protestantism. The main target of all of them is the Bible, the written Word of God. It is protected. All of it is protected by our form of government, our freedom of speech to warn the people about this papal pogrom and to criticize our government for kowtowing to the Vatican is all preserved in our Protestant Constitution. Do you realize your First Amendment right was given to you for the very purpose of guaranteeing you the right, the specific right to criticize both the Pope and the King? How many of your Protestant pastors would ever tell you that? How many of them have ever told you that? But that's the historical reality. We owe our First Amendment rights of freedom of speech, freedom of the press, to the Protestant Reformation, and to no one else. So any attack on our freedom of speech or our freedom of press should automatically be conceived in our minds as an attack of the papacy against Protestantism, a means of counter-reformation. And the New World Order simply cannot succeed as long as Protestantism remains in the world. Papal monarchy, global papal monarchy, cannot exist in the world as long as there is an open Bible and God's people who read it and demand their liberty. R.W. Thompson foresaw the day that has now enveloped us. He says further that the Pope would have take uh, that the Pope would take from the people the right to make any laws, except such as he shall consider consonant to the divine law. There is not the least doubt that the Pope would subject the state to the domination of the Roman Catholic Church in the entire domain of faith and morals, everybody knows. That he would give entire independence to his hierarchy, that is the priesthood of the Roman Catholic Church in the United States, so that they should not be answerable to any civil law, even for crimes of the greatest magnitude, like career pedophilia, there is abundant and convincing proof. See how prophetic this book is? He even foretold that if given the power and authority that he once had in the world, the Pope would see to it that none of his priests or, or prelates could ever be subject to any criminal charge or tried in any civil court. And that's the way it exists in this country today. Pedophile priests all over this country, and I've, as I've cited so many times, the BBC a documentary, the, the title of which escapes me at the moment, there are 40, at that time, there were 4,500 open cases of priest pedophilia in this country. And yet, it's hardly talked about. 
in the mainstream or alternative medias, much less justice rendered in civil courts. No, those priests enjoy what the Pope calls the pontifical secret. That's an internal affair of the Roman Catholic Church. The civil power has absolutely no jurisdiction over a pedophile priest. And R.W. Thompson says that he would give entire independence to his Roman Catholic priesthood in the United States so that they should not be answerable to the civil law, even for crimes of the greatest magnitude, there is abundant and convincing proof. That the Pope would abolish every other form of religious belief but that of his own church and secure to it the prerogative of exclusiveness by intolerant penal laws and abolish freedom of speech and freedom of the press, he has himself avowed in almost every form of utterance. Therefore, we have the greatest possible interest in knowing to what extent he is likely to obtain obedience from his Roman Catholic followers in this country upon each and all of these great and vital questions what kind of institutions he would erect in the place of those we have, and how he proposes in his unbounded pontifical benevolence to better our condition. The field of such an inquiry is exceedingly broad, and we, but, we may do but little more than enter within its borders, taking care to keep in mind that the fact that in this country of Protestant freedom we have nothing to do with the religious convictions of any man or his want of them, except in so far as they may be made a pretext for assailing the Constitution and the laws of this country. To an attack upon these by either a foreign or domestic foe, we are not yet prepared for tame submission. says R.W. Thompson. But just remember, that was back in 1876. They were not prepared for tame submission to the papacy. That's not true today. The United States has passively acquiesced to the self-arrogated divine right prerogative of the Pope as the vicar and the replacement of God on earth to overthrow our Protestant institutions. And that guilt not only lies with our government, but our Protestant pastors, our evangelical belly pastors, have kowtowed to the Pope's counter-reformation, Vatican Council II, the ecumenical movement. The Roman Catholic Church has defeated this once Protestant land both spiritually and temporally. The government has gone Romeward, and so have the churches. If R.W. Thompson was alive today and could see what is happening in this country, he wouldn't turn in his grave. He'd come out and stone them all to death. R.W. Thompson understood because he was astutely qualified to assess the greatest threats to our Protestant institutions in this country, both foreign and domestic, identified both the foreign and domestic power that would indeed overthrow this country and why it would do it and how it would do it. That foreign and domestic power is Roman Catholicism. And we can just look in the rearview mirror and see how it all unfolded, just exactly the way R.W. Thompson predicted, if we fail to recognize the imminent threat that Roman Catholicism poses to our Protestant constitutional republic. Now we're going to delve into chapter 6 of this book. We're going to talk about the claim of divine power over the temporal power by Pope Pius IX, continuing our discussion of the syllabus of error, its extent. He alone defines its limits, 
the effect of this in the United States, the principles of the Constitution within the jurisdiction of the papacy, Germany, Italy, etc., other countries, the Pope stirs up insurrection there, the Jesuits are expelled, Papists in the United States justify resistance to the law of Germany. That's right. Papists raising up militant resistance of a foreign land to a foreign land, Germany. Same laws in the United States, the effect upon allegiance, the Bavarian protest, the abuse of the confessional, the power of absolution, the immoral immoral bearings of the confessional box of the Roman Catholic Church. A broad scope in this next chapter, but R.W. Thompson can handle it. He says, Since the formation of our government, there has been among the people of the United States much discussion, and some of it angry and exciting, involving the extent and distribution of civil power and the relations between the national government and that of the states. Yet no portion of them have been dis disposed to assail the fundamental principles upon which our institutions are founded. Their differences, although often radical and threatening, have hitherto failed to eradicate their, from their minds the strong attachment they have always borne to that form of popular freedom and sovereignty which constitutes one of the most distinctive features in our plan of government. Even sectional jealousies and civil war, with all their terrible and deplorable consequences and with the bad passions they invariably engender, have failed to destroy or weaken this attachment. And today, there is no single state in the Union which, if it were remodeling its domestic government, would not preserve with the most sed sedulous care the separation of church from the state, so that the people should remain the primary source of all power, all civil power. Now take the obverse of that. If, if it were allowed in this country the church to unite with the state, where would the people be? back at the bottom again, just like they were during the Dark Ages. That's what R.W. Thompson is warning about. A union of church and state is a sign that we, the people, are under attack. And history is once again about to repeat itself. Bloody history once again is about to repeat itself. Inquisition Crusades, bloodshed, religious persecution, the stifling of religious liberty, the stifling of the freedom of speech and freedom of the press, freedom of conscience, is about to repeat itself. He says, if there is a single sentiment which has universality among all the lovers of our free institutions, it is this, the separation of church and state. R.W. Thompson wraps it all up into that one issue, the separation of church and state. R.W. Thompson knew what made the papal system tick so efficiently in the Dark Ages. It was the union of church and state. And if we want to preserve the people as the top of the government in this country, we must at all costs prevent the union of church and state the condition under which the papacy is the most powerful, the most successful in her diabolical aim to control the whole world. If you find any limitation, any, go any government law that restricts your speech or the freedom of the press or seeks to unite the church and the state or to recognize the Roman Catholic Church as the official religion of this country, either overtly or covertly, which is currently taking place in this country, you know that we are returning back to the union of church and state, the system under which the papacy ruled without restraint. Now, he says, they cling to it, that is, the union of church and state, 
with affection like that of which the mother hugs her offspring to her bosom. Excuse me, I want to correct myself. Those who love liberty cling to the separation of church and state. I think that's what R.W. Thompson is trying to say here. If there is a single sentiment which has universality among all lovers of our free institutions, it is this. They cling to the separation of church and state he's talking about. He says they cling to it with the affection like that which the mother hugs her offspring to her bosom. And it is something of a tax upon their patience when they see this great principle, the separation of church and state, assailed at the the bidding of a foreign power. He's talking about the Pope here. If they see this great principle of the separation of church and state assailed at the bidding of a foreign power, no matter whether that power is clothed in the robes of ecclesiastical or temporal royalty or both combined. Now, R.W. Thompson, again, is writing in 1876. What do we know after reading The Secret Terrorist by Bill Hughes? What do we know about this period of time? That's when the papacy and the Jesuits got together, united with the the contracting, the high contracting powers of Europe, the powers that be, that is the monarchical system, and they decided to do whatever it was in their scope and power to do to overthrow this Protestant constitutional republic. And one of those means of overthrow was wholesale Roman Catholic immigration to this country. This is where we got the Leopold Society that financed the simply letting Roman Catholic prisoners out of the prisons of Rome, uh, out of Europe. Roman Catholics, devout Roman Catholics in the prisons in Europe, gave them enough money for a boat ticket to the United States and told them, you go to America and you vote the way we tell you to vote, because you've got equal power with every Protestant in the country. And will you can help us elect a Roman Catholic government for the United States and will overthrow that Protestant constitution and will install a papal hierarchy in the country and will take it over. Now, obviously, every Roman Catholic wasn't ex- wasn't uh, excited by those very words. I mean, they, they didn't go around preaching all this, but that was the strategy that came out of the Council of Vienna, Verona, and Chieti. Vienna, Verona, and Chieti. Cherry is the way many people pronounce it. It was in Italy that the papacy and the Jesuits and the monarch, the old monarchical powers that be, as is so popularly used to describe them, the rich ruling elite that were put on vacation by the Protestant Reformation, they all got together and said, we're going to restore our power and authority. And we're going to do it from America. And we have to take over America, and we're going to do it partly through immigration. The Leopold Society, Arch, uh, Metternich of Austria, they all got together, and they financed a mass immigration of Roman Catholics of Europe. Many of the dredges of the European society were shipped here. Irish and European societies were shipped to this country emigrated to this country, and as Roman Catholics answered to their American Roman Catholic hierarchy and voted as they were told to vote, they occupied all the big cities in the United States, Boston, Philadelphia, New York, Washington, and they became a political power in this country, and it remains an ever-growing political threat. And like I said before, the target is Protestantism and its Protestant constitution and its Protestant institutions. <clears throat> now, Pope Pius IX has been of late years, according to R.W. Thompson, exceedingly fruitful of encyclical and apostolic letters. In other words, he's writing his fingers to the bone, trying to round up all of his Catholics for this papal jihad against this Protestant constitutional republic, 
Pope Pius IX has been of late years exceedingly fruitful of encyclical and apostolic letters intended for the double purpose of warning the nations and advising the Roman Catholic faithful in all of those nations. He deemed it necessary to issue one when he rejected the guarantees of his spiritual freedom offered to him by the Italian government so as to notify the world of the reason which prompted his refusal. That's right. Victor Emmanuel said, <coughs> You're no longer a king. I am the king. But you can remain the bishop of Rome if you like. We know you have a lot of followers, and we don't want to meddle in your religious affairs. Just take your temporal mitts off Italy. We'll do fine to, to form our own government. And the Pope protested, not only that he had been stripped of his temporal power by an infidel by the name of Victor Emmanuel, but that Victor Emmanuel, an infidel who deserved excommunication, should offer, should dare to offer that the Pope could remain an ecclesiastical power Listen to the rationale of the Pope in protest of this. It says, He deemed it necessary to issue a papal encyclical when he rejected the guarantees of his spiritual freedom offered him by the Italian government so as to notify the world of the reasons which prompted his refusal. That's right, he refused to receive any any ecclesiastical rights from a civil power. And it was dated in May 15, 1871, and while less comprehensive than what, what that which accompanied the syllabus of 1864, it is equally explicit in the claim that the civil principality of the Pope, the temporal power of the Pope, was conferred to him not by any human concession but divine providence, and I'm telling you, Victor Emmanuel, you can't give me any rights. You can't take any way because I get it all from God himself. I'll take nothing from the hand of a beggar. We'll talk about it more on the program tomorrow. Don't forget Vince Bennett's writing.